Welcome to a conversation with Suleika Jihad. We'd like to thank Imogen for making this session possible. This will be a very special, inspiring discussion between Suleika Jihad and Nancy Sankata. Both bring a unique perspective to this talk. Suleika is a writer, author, wife, daughter, sister, friend, and cancer survivor who has shared her experiences and created a powerful message of living well. Nancy has been an oncology social worker with a particular interest in bone marrow failure diseases for over 40 years and has worked with children, families, and adults through their cancer journeys. Nancy is a mother, wife, daughter, sister, and friend who has focused much of her career on the evolution of hope. We are thrilled to introduce Suleika Jawad and Nancy Sankata. To begin, Sulika, it's an honor and a privilege for us that you've agreed to join us here today. Um, we began an OCRA book club several months ago, and we kicked it off with your book, um, you know, Between Two Kingdoms. And I have to say, we immediately had 75 people who signed up for the book club, and people really fell in love with you and the book. And it's almost like everybody wants to know the ongoing story, like from where the book ended for the rest of your life. So you have a big fan club in this audience, and there's probably about 700 people with ovarian and gynecological um, cancers listening to us now. So um, in thinking about your your story, we know that you were diagnosed with leukemia at 22 and had to go um, through transplant. Do you want to talk about that a little bit and the experience of how you think it influenced your life? Mm. Well, first of all, I just want to say how thrilled I am to be in conversation with you. And even though we're not in a room with the 700 something people, um, how thrilled I am to be in all of your uh, to be in your radius. Uh, it's a real honor for me. And I'm so grateful that Between Two Kingdoms was chosen for the book club. That's every writer's uh, biggest praise. Um, and so I'm very happy to be here. Um, so I was diagnosed almost exactly after uh, one year after I graduated from college. Uh, but maybe like some of the people joining us today, my story did not start with the moment of diagnosis. It started long before. It started with the months and months and months of misdiagnosis, of sensing that something was wrong and desperately craving answers. Um, I was first diagnosed with leukemia and reassured that this is perfectly common in young women and sent home with iron supplements, which of course did not work. Um, and as I started to fall sick with colds and bouts of bronchitis, um, I ended up in the hospital where doctors ran every test they could think of, except for a bone marrow biopsy, which they didn't feel was necessary for someone of my age. And ultimately I was released with the diagnosis of burnout syndrome. Now, something about burnout syndrome didn't add up for me, but I think like a lot of young women um, and like a lot of people, I felt this sense of intimidation um, when in the midst of a doctor, I felt like I haven't gone to medical school. Who am I to question this diagnosis? And yet I knew that what was happening in my body was not a factor of pushing myself too hard. Um, and I started to believe not that something was amiss in my body, but that something was wrong with me. I really felt like I was losing my grip on my sanity. And that's what happens, I think, for so many of us um, when the actual journey to destination is a long, drawn-out one. Um, and it was also when I did get that actual diagnosis of leukemia, um, my first indication 
that no matter how brilliant and caring your medical team might be, you have to learn to become your own advocate. And I learned that lesson again and again and again over the next four years of treatment. Um, but very early on in um, that foray into chemo, I also realized how no two patients are the same. Um, we bring to the illness our own individual set of gifts and also of challenges, be it financial or personal or support system related. Um, and when I learned that I was going to be admitted to the hospital to undergo chemo, I did what most patients do, which is to hit up Google uh, to get a sense of what lay ahead. And I learned in that Google search right there sandwiched between hair loss and nausea that one of the side effects of my chemotherapy was infertility. Now, this came as a great shock to me um, because my doctors had never mentioned anything about infertility or fertility preservation services. Um, and also because at 22, I hadn't really even given thought to becoming a mother other than how not to become one mm -hmm. before I was ready. Um, and, you know, I understand that oftentimes cancer is the priority in the emergency. Um, but for me, preserving that possibility of becoming a mother someday felt really important to me. It felt like a kind of hope uh, to preserve that choice for my future self. And maybe more than that, to believe that I would exist in that future. Now, we talk about individualized medicine, about personal medicine, um, but I think so much of the challenge of living with cancer, um, aside from, you know, the many physical side effects are really figuring out how to hold on to some sense of self, how to not only survive, but to actually live. Um, and so that really became my challenge in my early 20s. And it's remained a question that I'm continuously trying to find new answers to. You hit on so many things that are so relevant to the people who are listening. I mean, issues around fertility, fertility preservation, um, what the future will be, how you hold on to who you are and, and how you understand who you become because invariably this is an experience that changes what you think, how you see the world. And it really does make you at earlier ages or whatever age you're diagnosed with, right? Try to think about things that you may not have thought about related to your own self and your own identity. We know that you continue to be living between those two worlds, right? The, the, the world of illness and the, the other world. Mm -hmm. um, in that other world, people often really do not understand what it's like to be somebody having to make choices, living through painful situations, feeling lonely and isolated. How do you, or do you balance those two worlds mm -hmm. even today as you go through it still? So I learned early on that one of the great unfairnesses of cancer is how uncomfortable it can be for the people around you. Um, you know, there's a reason why when someone is befallen with tragedy, our first response is often, I have no words. Um, and sometimes when you don't have words, when you're worried about finding the exact right words, um, you end up saying nothing at all and staying away because of it. And that was something that um, I found really heartbreaking early on uh, after my diagnosis um, to realize 
that the people, some of the people I expected to be there for me, um, were not going to be able to for different reasons. Um, and there was this sense of feeling increasingly disconnected from the land of the living. I stopped going on social media because it was painful to see my friends, you know, starting careers and traveling the world and getting married and all the other big and small milestones of early adulthood. Um, and for about a year, I very much went into a kind of self-imposed retreat. I didn't know how to face my reality, which made it hard to explain it to the people around me who hadn't lived it. Um, and really, you know, that's what set me on the path of writing was trying to find those words, um, yearning for a space where I could talk about the things that felt impossible to talk about everything from infertility to early onset menopause because of chemotherapy to the experience of navigating a romantic relationship when you're navigating an illness um, to the maddening part-time job that is dealing and negotiating with health insurance. I wanted to write all of it. And when I first started that process, it was in the privacy of my journal. But what I found in the course of writing my story in my own words on my own terms is that I felt lighter afterwards. I wasn't carrying so much in privacy and in the isolation of my body. And there was a kind of clearing sense that I had. And again, this was not fancy writing. It was journal writing. It was okay. purely for myself. Um, but in trying to describe those things, I better understood them. And that made it easier for me to communicate with the people around me. Um, you know, I think so often... Um, when you receive a cancer diagnosis, there's a thing that can happen where everyone puts on a brave stoic face for each other because we want to reassure, reassure each other. And that was true of me. And that was true of my parents and some of my friends. But what happens when everyone is trying to put a brave stoic face for one another and, and to nurse those fears in private is that, um, you end up not being able to communicate openly. And so once I was able to take the initiative to say, I know this is scary, I know this is hard, but I want us to be able to talk about the things that scare us and the things that are hard, um, this miraculous thing started to happen. I had some of the deepest, most powerful conversations of my life in that hospital room. And while perhaps some of my friends um, stayed away, uh, I began to meet fellow patients. I began to meet all kinds of people, old classmates, teachers, um, strangers on the internet, um, who really showed me what understanding and empathy looks like and raised the bar for the kind of person I want to be when someone else is struggling. And so that process of staying connected to both worlds, you know, to the kingdom of the sick and the kingdom of the well is something that I've had to navigate on a whole different level. Um, a year and a half ago, I learned that my leukemia was back. I underwent a second bone marrow transplant. Um, but unlike the first time, um, I will be in treatment indefinitely. There is no life after cancer for me. Um, instead, it's learning to live life with cancer. Um, and so, you know, that cliche that it takes a village, um, it's a cliche because it's true. And I've come to realize how crucial it is to cultivate a community 
um, not only of good doctors and nurses and social workers um, and family, but also chosen family, um, many of whom are fellow patients and are the kind of people um, I can speak freely to without any need for censorship or you know, positive platitudes um, or a neat bow wrapped up um, when stating a fear. You know, many people who have cancer embrace one of the shirts that says cancer sucks, right? And, and I think <laughs> that as you talk about it, there's so many pieces. I, I think you are talking to many people for whom cancer will be always a part of their lives. And so then it does, there is a bit of a paradigm shift, right? In this is the world I'm living in and how do I make this the best world that it can be? And when you think about the community that you cultivate, I wanna talk a little bit about the friends you've met who are also experiencing cancer. We have you know, a mentor program where we have mentors and mentees of people who've been through the journey we have um, support groups where people meet each other. We have the book club and expressive arts program. And one of the things that has become so clear is that the energy and the connections between people offer something that all of the professionals in the world cannot offer and all of the family members can't because there is a depth to which people understand the experience. And, you know, you think in life, we always create communities with people who understand some component of our life. And this is the same. So I too am thinking about some of your friends, some of the friends you continue to be connected to and some of the friends that you've lost along this journey and how they stay with you. So when I first got diagnosed, my mom found a young adult cancer support group in the town where um, they live in upstate New York. And every week she would nag at me and say, you have to go to the support group. You have to go to the support group. And I had zero desire to go to a support group. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was already dealing with this diagnosis that had upended my life. And the last thing I wanted to do on, you know, the rare evening when I felt well enough to venture outside of the house was to sit with a bunch of strangers and talk some more about cancer. None of that sounded fun <laughs> or appealing to me. Um, but I was also extremely isolated and I was really angry in those first couple of months. Um, I dealt with this paradigm shift in my life by, you know, holding myself up in my childhood bedroom with its embarrassing pink walls and dusty posters of boy bands still taped to the wall. And I made it my mission to set the world record for the number of Grey's Anatomy episodes watched mm -hmm. consecutively. <laughs> and Grey's Anatomy might seem like a weird choice uh, when you're going through cancer treatment. Um, but I enjoyed seeing some, you know, very Hollywood, uh, but still some version of my reality being reflected back to me. Um, and at some point, you know, I realized that in trying to stuff all of my emotions about this down and trying to numb myself with distractions, I wasn't making the anger go away. I wasn't making the fear and the sadness go away. If anything, it was growing and deepening inside of me. And so I agreed to go to a cancer support group. I only ever made it to one uh, because shortly thereafter, I uh, got hospitalized for my first bone marrow transplant. Um, but it was amazing. I was so stunned as everyone went around the room and began to share about different aspects of their life, about the financial stress of going through cancer, about the mental health struggles that accompany um, a cancer diagnosis, about you know all of it. And for the first time, 
since my diagnosis, I felt connected. I felt open. I was examining what was happening to me. And I walked out of that room feeling so much lighter, um, which was the opposite of what I expected. Mm. Um, but the nature of my particular diagnosis, which is myelodysplastic syndrome and acute myeloid leukemia is very low blood counts and frequent hospitalizations. And so I found it really challenging. And this was 10 years ago. There's so much more in the way of virtual gatherings as mm -hmm. evidenced by yeah. this virtual gathering. Mm -hmm. um, but it made it hard for me to feel like I could participate in the in-person support groups. And so instead I turned to writing and I will never forget the day my New York Times column Life Interrupted uh, which is about the experience of being young and sick launch in the New York Times. And I woke up to hundreds of emails from people all over the world, many of whom were dealing with different forms of cancer, but many of whom were having major life interruptions of all kinds. Um, and there was one email in particular from a young man uh, in the room next door to mine on the bone marrow transplant floor. Um, who realized we were there at the same time and we were both on isolation status. So we couldn't meet or converse. But one day as I was being rolled out of my room to get a CT scan, I had them stop at his door and I knocked on the window and waved and he waved back to me. And it was such a simple moment. We didn't even get to speak, but that sense of connection of not being alone in this um, sustain me for the next couple of weeks. Um, and so I've been really fortunate through my writing. Um, and once I was well enough through various support groups to meet and befriend lots of cancer comrades, um, as many of you know, the night side of befriending lots of people in the cancer community is losing them too. Um, and so I lost a lot of friends in those early years. Um, and it was heartbreaking and it was triggering um, because of course there's the thought of, you know, if this can happen to my friend, then it can happen to me. Um, but more than anything, you know, those um, to this day are my deepest, most cherished friendships. And I would trade the grief any day over the ability to feel that connected, that seen and understood by another human being. I think that's a really important thing to hear you say, because we always worry. Um, we know the strengths and the weaknesses of the relationships, but we also um, agree with you, right? That that what you find and the way you find that connection and that part of yourself that, that will always be with you and with them is just, is such an important feature. I want to go back just to something interesting. You talk about um, when your column launched. How did you have the wherewithal to submit that column to the New York Times? Like, like what what gave you the strength to do that? So let me go on record and say that I am a deeply fearful person. I am a person who lives with an immense amount of imposter syndrome that can make it very difficult for me to start anything, let alone to see a project through to its end. Um, and so I had always loved writing. I've been writing for as long as I was old enough to hold a pen. Oh. Um the idea of becoming a writer did not feel practical or achievable to me. And I was interested in becoming a journalist. Uh, that seemed like the real world job equivalent of becoming a fiction writer or even an essayist. Um, but when I got sick, all of that felt like it was over for me. Um, I wasn't able to go anywhere to leave my hospital room, much less, you know, travel to 
around the world and interview people and be a war correspondent. Um, and I felt like I didn't have um, anything to write about because I had envisioned myself as someone who helps other people tell their stories. Oh. Um, but it was in the process of keeping that journal, uh, which I did as part of a hundred day project with mm -hmm. my family and friends. Um, and the premise of it was really simple. One tiny creative act each day for a hundred days that I felt like I really found my voice for the first time. And it was first person writing, but um, with the aim of having that I become a you and then a we. Um, and Toni Morrison has this great line and I'm going to absolutely butcher it. So I'll try to paraphrase it to the best of my ability. But she says, if um, there's a story you want to read and it doesn't exist, then you must write it. Um, and at the time I was reading all kinds of cancer memoirs um, but many of them were written from the perspective of someone who had survived. And I was very much in the trenches. I Regular chemo hadn't worked for me. I was doing a phase two clinical trial, um, hoping to have a bone marrow transplant. And I really wanted to write from the vantage point of uncertainty, to write from the trenches of treatment when you don't know how your story is going to end. Um, and I wanted to write about the things I wanted to learn about. I wanted to write about sexual health. Um, I wanted to write about menopause. I wanted to write about infertility. I, you know, those were the things that I was grappling with privately um, and desperately wanted to know more about. Um, so about a uh, six weeks before my bone marrow transplant, um, given that I had never been published before, uh, I decided to start a blog. Uh, I was in the hospital at the time and I was watching YouTube videos, teaching myself how to build out a very, very basic blog. Um, and I started to write on that blog and I took it really seriously. I wrote every day and I treated it like my job because it felt so good to have a job to do other than simply um, feeling like a passive agent and patient in this experience. Um, and to my surprise, that blog started to gain traction and I got an email and then a phone call from an editor at the New York Times asking me to write an essay. Um, and I would have been thrilled pre-diagnosis for uh, a fact-checking position at the New York Times, let alone the opportunity to publish an essay. But I think the thing about staring your mortality straight in the eye is that um, you don't live in the delusion that we have endless time, uh, that there's time to figure things out, time to do the things that you want. And so I very politely thanked her and said I wasn't interested in writing an essay, then took a deep breath and pitched to her this idea of a column. Mm -hmm. um, and she replied, okay, that they would do a couple of installments, see how it went, and then we could continue the conversation from there. Um, and immediately after I hung up the phone, my <laughs> next thought was, shit, I don't even know if I can know how to write a column. I don't even know if I'm well enough to do this. Uh, what have I gotten myself into? Um, but I think there's a weird way in which facing death can make you brazen. Um, it made me want to ask for the thing I really wanted, um, because being rejected couldn't be any worse mm. than the rest of the stuff I was living. Um, and it was really hard to write that column, uh, while dealing with illness. I wrote all of it from bed. I would work in five minute, 10 minute bursts, take naps, it was slow. It felt torturous in moments, um, but it felt so deeply rewarding um, to pursue the thing I'd always wanted to do, even if it looked nothing like what I'd imagined. 
you know, it's an interesting portrayal in your own words, almost of how cancer made you stronger and that it allowed you to take risks and to push in a way that you wouldn't have. I mean, I think about like the conversation of, can I do a column, right? Like that's amazing. And we are so grateful that it, it worked out. And, you know, you, you talk about wanting to be a journalist and to portray other people's stories and by portraying your story, you really have enabled people to tell their stories and give voice to the things they're feeling. So it's really a remarkable thing that you have done and, and where you have come from. Um, do you mind for a minute talking about relationships and how that you do? You know, we, again, many of us live through your relationship during your transplant because you were so um, honest about portraying what that was and that experience. And um, we were all rooting for you, your relationship with John by the end of the book. And so talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So when I got diagnosed the first time around, like I said, I was 22. I had recently met someone wonderful, um, but we were new to love, new to each other. And then the diagnosis came and it changed and in some ways accelerated the course of our whole relationship. Um, I was fortunate that he was willing to be there to stick around throughout that process. Um, and as anyone here knows, who's married, who's in a relationship, who's attempted to date while well, in cancer treatment, it presents very real challenges and fears. Um, and ultimately that relationship didn't survive, uh, those four years of treatment. It's hard for me to know, you know, if it would have survived without the diagnosis. Um, but the stresses of navigating that caregiver patient relationship, um, especially at that age, especially without the foundation of having been together for um, a longer period of time pre-diagnosis, all of that was really challenging. And I emerged from treatment and emerged from that breakup feeling profoundly heartbroken um, and profoundly guarded. Uh, I had this sense that what I had been through would be too much for a new person to take on. Um, and I also think when you've suffered a lot of loss, there's a way in which it can make you want to guard your heart to protect yourself against the possibility of new love, new loss. Um, and that was me. I spent the next couple of years really struggling to figure out how to talk about what I'd been through, if to talk about it at all, how to talk about some of those long-term imprints of treatment like infertility and menopause, which is not something that is a common discussion topic when you're in your mid twenties. Um, and I, you know, met this wonderful friend of mine who I've known uh, since I was, you know, 13 years old at band camp. Um, and we started dating and that's John. Um, and we're married now. We got married on the eve of my second bone marrow transplant in a little ceremony in our living room. Um, and I've had the complete opposite experience um, with this recurrence. Instead of seeing cancer drive two people apart, I've had um, the gift of getting to see how that can go in the opposite way, how it can bring two people closer together. Um, and so I think um, a big part of what made uh, this experience different on the relational level is that I understood that in addition to attending to the physical side effects 
of cancer, I also needed to attend to the psychological ones. So on day one, when I got diagnosed, I started therapy. Um, I also convinced my husband to start therapy. Um, I wanted us to have spaces where we could process what was happening individually and then together. Um, I also learned um, to ask for help differently. In my first relationship, I was, uh, my, my then boyfriend was um, my primary caregiver. And while it was so wonderful to have the person I felt closest to be there all the time in all the most difficult moments, I really came to appreciate how challenging caregiving can be. Um, and when you're the patient, that's not always something you want to hear or think about. Um, but I've really come to understand that cancer doesn't just affect the individual, it ripples out into the entire community. And so this time around, I did a lot of trading off between John, my parents, friends. I was very conscious of not just attending to my needs, but making sure they were attending to theirs. It really sounds like an evolution in how relationships were in your life. You think about at 22, it's really hard to manage any relationship, <laughs> nonetheless, to try to do it on a bone marrow transplant unit. And I also think when you feel like you need help, it is really, really hard to ask for help. And it is really hard to imagine someone else could step in and be helpful in the way that the person you cared about most could be. Um, this is going to sound like a funny transition, but there's also this very special dog in your life, <laughs> right? Yes. So shortly after my first bone marrow transplant, against my doctor's orders, I adopted a very badly behaved scruffy terrier mutt from a shelter who became my beloved companion and my road dog, um, my literal road dog um, in the case of the very long road trip I took when I was coming out of treatment, um, but for all of my 20s. And having to learn to take care of a creature at a time when I could barely take care of myself was some of the best medicine I could have concocted for myself. It got me out of the house. It got me on a schedule. It got me out of my head and focused on being of service to a little creature that was entirely dependent on me. Um, and Oscar is his name. He changed my life. Um, and he unfortunately um, was diagnosed with cancer two weeks before I learned of my recurrence and died while I was in the bone marrow transplant unit. Um, and, you know, especially when you've suffered the loss of a beloved human, sometimes you know, people can roll their eyes at the idea of grief over a pet. Um, but I, I grieved that loss so deeply and um, really felt kind of unmoored without him when I got out of the hospital. Um, and to my surprise, a friend of mine had put me on a wait list for a service dog. Oh. And again, Shortly after that second transplant, I found myself with a new dog. Her name's River, mm -hmm. um, and she has become, once again, my companion, um, you know, the creature that gets me out of the house. Just this morning, I was hiking in the woods with her, um, and, you know, that might look different for different people, whether it's a pet or whether it's some kind of volunteer work. But I know that for me, especially having been the recipient of so much help and support, it's, um, it feels so good and it feels so balancing to be able to extend that care um, outward, um, both to my dog and uh, to my community and you know, to fellow friends who are in treatment. Um, but I think 
stepping outside of my own circumstances, my own prognosis, and um, in whatever way I can, trying to show up for the beloveds around me is something that's really carried me through both of these bouts of treatment. There's such wisdom in your words, Suliga. Uh, I have just a couple more questions, if that's okay. Um, you know, many of the people facing the cancers we're working with have been approached about clinical trials. You had that experience. What did it bring up for you when someone asked you or told you that you would need to be on a clinical trial? Thank you for asking this question. It's something that I think is so important to talk about. So I spent my first six weeks of treatment doing a standard but brutal chemotherapy treatment uh, inpatient. And at the end of that, I learned that not only had the treatment not worked, but the leukemic blasts in my body had more than doubled. Um, and my doctors were quick to reassure me that there was still hope, that there was a phase two clinical trial that I was now eligible for. Um, but rather than feeling hope at the idea of a clinical trial, I felt complete terror. Uh, I did not want to be a guinea pig. I didn't want an experimental treatment that hadn't yet been proven safe or effective. I wanted the certainty that the toll of my treatments were worth the havoc they wreaked on my body, on my family, on everything. Um, and it was a real leap of faith for me to enroll in that trial. Um, I was really scared to do it. Um, and while the trial did have tough side effects, um, it got me into remission within six months and allowed me to move on to the bone marrow transplant. Um, and so I really had to reorient my perception of clinical trials, um, to understand them not as um, last resort options, but opportunities, uh, not only to advance cancer research, but to um, have access to, you know, cutting edge treatments and um, technology. And so, you know, now I find myself not in a clinical trial, um, but in an experimental treatment that again, is not necessarily proven to be safe or effective. And I think when you're doing an experimental treatment, it can be hard to have faith, to keep your spirits up, to know that this is worth whatever uh, toll it's taking on your body and your life. Um, but what I think about in those moments when I feel afraid, when I feel discouraged is how much has changed just in the 10 years since I was first diagnosed. Uh, this time around, I did not spend six weeks uh, in the hospital doing chemo. I did not do a six month long clinical trial. I had access to a new drug um, that had come onto the market since uh, in, in the last decade. And that got me into remission in one month. Um, with minimal side effects and no hospitalizations. And so I am putting my faith in those trials, in the idea that we have no idea what's coming down the road and that there is progress happening every day and that we are a part of that progress. There's an explosion of progress happening every day and um, I think you did a great job of explaining that for people who may have apprehensions in recognizing science is moving forward with the clinical trials, with the experimental treatment. Um, do you have any advice that you want to give 
your devoted fans? Okay, I'll start by giving a piece of advice that was given to me that did not work for me. Okay. <laughs> um, so after this most recent transplant, um, when I got the first biopsy results and learned that, yes, I was in remission, but that I would have to do treatment indefinitely, um, I started to cry. Um, and my doctor asked me what was wrong. And I said, um, it's the word indefinite. Uh, I don't know how to do this when there's no end date in sight. And he said to me, you have to live every day as if it's your last day. Um, and that's what I tried to do for the first couple of months. Um, but I'm no longer a fan of that approach. Um, I think there's a kind of doomsday cast to it mm -hmm. um, and that it kind of pushes you into a place of like wanting to seize as much as you can from life, to take as much as you can from it. Um, and so instead now, and, and the advice that I would give um, to all of you is to shift out of that thinking and into trying to live every day as if it is your first to wake up as I imagine a newborn baby does with a sense of awe and wonder and curiosity. And ever since I've started doing that, rather than trying to wring meaning out of everything or trying to take as much as I can from the time that I have, um, I've focused into giving, into you know, what can I give myself today that will feel nourishing and good and fun and interesting? What can I give to the people I love? Um, and it sounds maybe so simple, um, but it's really been a profound shift for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope that maybe it might be for you too. I think the hope for today and the fact that tomorrow is possible is in fact, in many ways, much more help, helpful and hopeful. <laughs> so we appreciate that. You know, if we were in the conference room, I think that there would be a tremendous round of applause for you right now. So assume that that is happening and know that you and your writing have helped to inspire so many people. And we would like to offer you honorary membership in our book club. If there is any time you want to come, <laughs> we will invite you. We'll send you the book. Oh. And, um, and we would appreciate having you. Um, I think that the honor is 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 ours to get to know you, to hear the way you think about life. And we so appreciate you. And I don't know if you know how many people have bought the book or how many followers you have on Instagram, but those <laughs> numbers are astronomical. So Congratulations to you, and we so love and appreciate all of your efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The gratitude and the love is, is mutual. Thank you so much. Thank you.